everybody, it's Allison Williams here, your law firm mentor. Law Firm Mentor is a business coaching service for solo and small law firm attorneys. We help you grow your revenues, crush chaos in business, and make more money. Hi, everybody. It's Allison Williams here, your Law Firm Mentor. And this week, we are talking about productivity. And I chose this topic to talk about because someone recently shared with me a video I recorded a while back on our YouTube channel. By the way, if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, it's, you know, pretty basic, youtube.com forward slash law firm mentor. And one of the things that, um, that this person picked out and, and decided to share with me, um, he's been kind of a follower for a while, and he said that it really struck a chord that uh, I was talking about focus and in particular, managing your time and your energy and your activity in a way that you are productive and not just busy. So um, we kind of had an exchange about why that was something that resonated with him, but it, it reminded me that I hadn't yet recorded something to give you guys a better uh, framework to flush out a lot of the minutiae that went into that, pod, that, that particular video. Because even though I recorded the video and laid out some, some parts of the acronym FOCUS that I think are helpful, I really didn't go into a lot of detail because you know, it was designed to be a shorter recording. So today we're gonna talk about that. So what do I mean when I say that being busy is the enemy of being productive? Well, the first thing, and this is where I start everything that we do here at Law Firm Mentor, everything that I talk about on this podcast is really about where your mind is when you approach your work. And there's something that I think we all have to be mindful of, which is that we all get a little dopamine hit off of activity that we feel internally gets us what we want. So whether you're actually getting what you want or not, the feeling that you are moving toward what you want is almost like an addictive sort of um, internal feeling. And if you're not careful and you're not very intentional about it, you can be working really hard and feel like you're getting a lot done when in fact you're not. And you look up one day and you say, I have been working so hard for so long but I'm only making $100,000. Or I've been working so hard for so long, but I only have $250,000 in revenue and I'm frustrated and I'm exhausted. And a lot of that mind work, a lot of that frame comes from the place of accepting where you are as the product of your activities. And it is very much the product of your activities. But of course, we know that your activities didn't just materialize, you planned them, at least on some level. You either plan them or you allow that activity to fill your days. So you, by omission of failing to plan, planned the activity. But regardless, you actually made a decision at some point of what you were going to spend your time on. But you didn't do so in a way that was going to get you what you want. So I'm going to walk you through an acronym. I said it earlier, it's FOCUS, for how you can be more intentional about the work that you do. And this is the work that you do in all spheres of your life. This is not just your lawyering work. This is your lawyering work. This is your business ownership work. This is your mentoring of others work. This is your relationship. This is your finances. It's everything in your life. How you can create a frame around your activity so that you can get more of what you want intentionally without having to expend more time and energy and resources chasing your tail, feeling that you're not being productive because you're being so busy. So first let's review what the FOCUS acronym is. Okay, I'm gonna give it to you and then we're gonna break it down. So FOCUS stands for first, delegate the goal. O is for organize your calendar goals. C is for communicate to others. U is for use your discretion. And S is for systematize. All right, piece by piece. First, the F, which is about what's first, okay? What's first in anything that you do is the mindset and the approach with which you are going to do it. You're going to obviously try to train your mind on becoming the new thought processes, the new thought patterns that you're going to create. And we talk a lot about this in the Law Firm Mentor Movement Facebook group, and I have a whole recording on 
how you can use thought work to start to be more successful in business. But in terms of where you start, the first thing you always have to do is ask yourself, how am I looking at this? And one of the things that people are, uh, who, are, who are good lawyers, who own businesses that are not going where they want them to be, is that they are not focusing in the first instance on the goal. They are focusing on getting away from what they don't want. So, and I see this all the time when I ask lawyers, what is it that you want? They will start telling me all of the things in their life that they don't want, and they will say, I want the opposite. So if they are not making enough money, they want to make more money. If they are not enjoying their time, they want to enjoy their time. If they are not working at the number of hours that they desire, they're working too many hours, they want to not work so many hours. And I talk a lot about the fact that you cannot create from a place of the opposite of what you want, because what you focus your attention on is what will grow. So if I am focusing on all the things that I don't want, I intentionally have to inherent in saying, I don't want X, I am thinking about X. So instead, rather than talking about what you don't want, the first part of this process of really focusing is to identify what you do want. And that means putting a hard, concrete goal to your business. Now, this is not putting a goal that says, I want more than I'm making right now, because frankly, if you're making $99, then as soon as you hit $100, you're making more. But most people, when they say more, they mean more by some margin. So you have to define what that number is, and that number needs to be specific. So in other words, if I sell a $5,000 service and I sell it to 20 people, then I immediately have $100,000. But if I sell my $5,000 service to 25 people, I immediately have $125,000. If I want to grow from 100 to 125, I can either sell more of my $5,000 service I can collect more. Let's say that I'm not paying, I'm not having people pay for the service in full up front and some people are defaulting. I can collect more of what I'm charging people or I can raise my price and say, well, instead of it being a $5,000 service, it's now going to be a $6,000 service. And before you debate whether you can or cannot raise your prices, whether you can or cannot collect more money and whether you can or cannot uh, sell more units, just accept in the first instance that those are the ways that we, that we generate more money in a business. So once you have that general frame and you have a goal in mind, you can start brainstorming, not whether you can reach your goal, but how. And oftentimes that first step, that very first step is the scariest because when you start putting that goal out there, and just identify what the goal is. Just put the number on a sheet of paper. All sorts of thoughts and feelings come up, which oftentimes will trigger us to say, I can't possibly do that. Nope, uh, it's a bad economy, I can't raise my prices. Or um, there are not people needing my particular service right now, so I can't possibly sell more of what I'm selling. Or nope, I can't possibly raise my hourly rate, change my retainer agreement, collect more dollars. You go into all the ways that you can't because you haven't committed to whatever the goal is. Because the reality is if you create a goal and you put it firmly in front of you, you write it down and you commit to it, then whatever comes into your mind as a way of achieving that goal, at least on the surface, has some level of ability to help you reach your goal. It doesn't mean that every thought you have is going to be one that you follow from thought to completion, but it has some ability. And that's because as soon as we start to direct our mind toward what we desire, the ways and means for us to achieve that goal is there. We might not see it right away, but I want you to really think about the fact that every time that you have had a goal, there has been some way to achieve the goal because frankly, we're not building spaceships that have never been built before. We're building law firms. And there are a lot of people who have built law firms before us. <laughs> there will be a lot of people who will build law firms after us. It is only the mind that tells us there is no way 
that allows us to stop and instigates us to stop thinking about the way. But the way is there. And so the first thing you have to do is commit to whatever the goal is. And once you have committed to your goal, you can then start looking for avenues in the different ways that are available. You can start asking questions. You can start talking to peers. You can start following protocols. You can start getting genuine help to accomplish your goal. But you can do something to move yourself toward the goal. But if your goal is simply, I don't want what I have now, your mind is going to go to the things that you don't have right now. And you're going to be focused on all of the things that are in your way to the goal instead of the goal itself. And that's a very counter, um, counterproductive way of moving forward in business. Okay. So once we have done the very first step, which is identify our goal, put it down on paper, commit to what that goal is, the next part of focus is the O, which is organize. Now, organize does not mean organize your desk. It can be that, but it really means at a bigger level, at a macro level, organize the things that are necessary in order for you to achieve the goal. So I want you to think about very basically, if you were to decide today that you needed to sell two more clients a month in order to get to an annual goal that you've decided upon, then how are you going to get there? Well, selling more in a month means you need to see more people. Seeing more people in a month means you need to increase your marketing. Increasing your marketing in a month means you need to engage in certain activities that constitute marketing in order to generate more leads and more opportunities to sell. So how are we going to do that? Well, the very first thing that we have to do always when we decide we need to get something done is to consult our calendar. Now this may seem a little rudimentary. Some of you may be saying like, duh, <laughs> like, isn't that kind of self-evident? But a lot of people don't live by the calendar, right? The calendar is one of those things we consult when we try to fit it in. But I'm talking about forward planning, i.e. we're not just talking about what we're going to put on our calendar between now and the end of the week. But we're going to be thinking about a way to handle our calendar to ensure that there is consistent movement forward in the direction of what it is that we want to accomplish. Now, that usually means some form of block scheduling. Okay. Now, when I say block scheduling, I don't mean just that you put a block of time on the calendar to deal with things like your email and your phone calls. That is certainly a part of it. But I'm talking about a reorganization of your priorities. So I want you to think about your calendar as a great big planning tool. Instead of here are the things that I have to get done that are already on the calendar, you can start to look at your calendar as a way of saying, instead of this is what someone else is going to put on my calendar, like a court hearing or a meeting with a client, you can say, how much of my time am I going to devote to each of the discrete categories of behavior that I have to engage in? How many hours a week or a month am I going to be selling? How many hours of a week or a month am I going to be marketing? And marketing, of course, includes a vast array of activity from anything from posting blogs to reaching out to contacts to one-to-one -one networking to um, social media posting, right? There's activity that can be engaged in. And if you're not the one who's gonna do the activity, you're gonna outsource it, to an SEO company or a social media manager, you're still gonna need to have time on your calendar to review that content, to ensure that a content calendar is being followed, to ensure that you're actually meeting with the people that you're getting them scheduled on your calendar for one-to-one -one networking. So there has to be some time commitment on your part, but before you start just sticking things on the calendar, having a global plan for how many hours you're gonna to devote to each of the discrete activities on your calendar allows you to have a plan that is tied to the outcome. I.e., I don't just want more, right? I don't just want to 
um, have more money and therefore I'm going to do more marketing and I'll just work as many hours as I can to do that marketing because what tends to happen is either we overwork so that we are exhausted and not our best when we are doing the work that really matters like client facing and marketing facing, <laughs> networking, et cetera. But we also, for those of us that don't tend toward overwork, a lot of lawyers tend toward overwork, but we also will do things that tend toward, um, how do I put this? Probably the best way of saying it is, uh, we tend toward misaligned work. So you're putting in the hours toward the activity, but again, you haven't put a hypothesis on your goal. So you're not really doing work that is likely to get you where you want. You're just doing more of the work that is in a category, like I'm doing more marketing or I'm doing, I'm doing more selling without actually having acquired the skill necessary to have a great likelihood that that activity is gonna lead to more clients, if that's what your ultimate goal is. So once you have the macro plan, you then have to work on the micro plan. And that's probably where most people that use their calendar very religiously probably have the most comfort, right? The macro plan is planning, big picture, time allocation for activity that's gonna lead you to the goal. But the micro plan is making sure that the stuff that has to get done actually fits on the calendar so that that amount of time that you said you were gonna be marketing or selling or managing team or whatever it is, that that time ultimately fits on the calendar based on the number of hours you wanna work each week. And for that, I do highly recommend block scheduling. And that is making sure that you dedicate a specified amount of time to do one activity, okay? And I cannot stress this enough. I know that lawyers think there's so much to do. It's all coming at me all at once. I have to multitask. But the reality is when you are diverting your attention from activity to activity to activity, back and forth and back and forth, right? I open up my computer. I have a letter that I have to get out. I type one sentence of a letter. I get an email notification. I jump over to answer that email. And when I'm in the midst of that email, I remember that I have to call somebody back related to some topic that I'm addressing in the email. So I pick up the phone. And while I'm on the phone with the person that I have to call back, another email notification comes in. So I'm on the phone with one person responding to the second email of the day when I am still not complete with the first email of the day and I still haven't sent that letter out. And all of those activities start to hodgepodge together. And I think, wow, I'm being really busy. And we would call that productive. But the reality is if you think about all the different ways that your mind has hopped from thing to thing to thing in a relatively short period of time, what you don't always realize is that you are exhausting yourself. In fact, I want you to think about this. This is for my non-court lawyers, right? My transactional lawyers. I want you to think about this because you have less uh, of an immediate opportunity to blame physical activity for the reason of your tiredness at the end of a day or even at the end of a week. But I want you to really think about the idea that if you were sitting in your office all day, there are some days where you seamlessly move from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. And let's say it's clients, right? You have clients scheduled, let's say every hour and a half of your day. And let's say you have some time in there for lunch and maybe you took a couple of phone calls and responded to a couple of emails. Your energy at the end of that day is gonna be very different than a day when you responded to 70 emails and wrote four or five letters and had two or three meetings with your team, two or three meetings with clients, a client stopped by the office, you had to deal with an emergency. Those days are tiring. They are not tiring because you are outside lifting bricks. They're not tiring because you are running around from place to place. In fact, if you're a Fitbit person and you track your steps on that day, you probably expended fewer steps on that day than on the day when you were going in and out of meetings, but not doing so much of the small activity, phone calls, emails, etc. So why are you tired? Like really think about that. You're not tired because of physical exertion. You're tired because of mental exertion. That's the reason why at the end of a day, as a lawyer, you can be just as tired as a waitress. The fact that you did not use your body does not take out of the fact that your mind was reeling and you were running 
full steam ahead all day long, expending energy that really could have been handled very differently. The same amount of work could have gotten done, but in a far more organized manner that would have taken less of your time to bounce from thing to thing to thing and have your mind have to constantly reset itself to the last activity that you were engaged in. So I want you to think about seriously putting together on your calendar a time blocking schedule and this does not have to be some sexy kanban board type arrangement where you need a technological tool in order to do it i'm talking about working in outlook or google calendar here okay we're going to the basics but just think about having blocks of time where you do activity and it could be depending on how much activity you have it could be hour blocks it could be two hour blocks could be three hour blocks Right? If you're drafting a complex motion, you might want to allocate three hours at a time, even though you're not going to knock it all out in one day. And in fact, that's probably best for you so that you have the opportunity to go uh, from where you are to where you want to be in sequence. So three hours today, three hours tomorrow, three hours, two days from now, four days from now, 10 days from now, however long it is before your deadline. But if you don't give yourself that time, then what tends to happen is you spend 15 minutes here, 30 minutes here, an hour, an hour there. And next thing you know, it takes you 20 hours to do something that normally would have taken 10 to 12 hours because you are so exhausted. And by the way, as much as people love to assume that lawyers overcharge and are just hungry to make money, the reality is most lawyers I know that know that they are scurrying around like a chicken with their head cut off tend to spend the amount of time necessary to get a good work product. But because of how they work and they're bouncing around and their mind is not focused when they are working, they tend to instinctively know that they charged more than they otherwise would have and so they reduce that time. So they spent 20 hours on the activity, but they only charged the client for 10. And if you're billing at $400 an hour, you just threw four grand out the window by virtue of not committing yourself to a focused schedule. So really think about putting that block scheduling into place and you have to try and see what works for you. I see so many times lawyers love to ask on Facebook, or throw out to listservs or ask in, um, in networking groups, hey, what are you doing for block scheduling? And somebody says, here, I'll send you my, my process for that. And then you take that process and you copy and paste it because it feels easier than building your own from scratch. And the problem with that is that your mind is not someone else's mind. You may only be able to focus for an hour at a time until you build up the muscle of really, really focusing again. Or you might be somebody who bangs it out really quickly, but prefers to do all of your communications work at the end of the day versus the beginning of the day. Whereas somebody else might say, I want to interface with the public and communicate with people at the beginning of the day because that's when my energy is the strongest. So you have to find what works for you. But think about your, again, your organizing is organizing your activity at the macro level and calendaring at the macro level attached to your goal and then filling in the spaces at the micro level, which is going to the calendar and actually putting things on the calendar so that you can get more focused attention through the activities that you have to get done. And this includes, again, everything that you have to get done. So if you are the lawyer and the business owner, you have to get all of that activity done. All of that needs to go on your calendar. All right, so next in our FOCUS acronym is C, and C stands for communicate. So this is communicating the rules that you are going to impose upon your schedule. And that means you have to do what I think is probably one of the greatest challenges for lawyers that I coach here at Law Firm Mentor, as well as uh, in, in the legal profession in general. Like this is not unique to lawyers that want to grow their business. You know, communicating to your team your hard and fast rules and then enforcing them is one of the easiest things for us to neglect to do. And it's not because what we're asking of our team is so onerous, and it's not because we don't believe in what we have decided. Oftentimes, it's because we forget the rule, right? If we haven't committed to the rule, then saying to somebody, hey, 
um, every Wednesday I am unavailable from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. You might block it out on your schedule. You might tell everyone in the office, but if you haven't truly committed to it, then somebody who's not living by your rules, right? They're living by their rules or, or they're living by whatever their process was for working with you before. They stop by your office and say, hey, you got 15 minutes and your instinct is to say, oh, sure, come on in. And then you have violated your rule and you have educated <laughs> your team that your rule is negotiable. Or my personal favorite, one of my favorite people decided that she was, um, she had to be out of the office for a medical procedure. And she was the person handling sales in her law firm. So she indicated to her team, do not book anybody for, let's just say five business days after my procedure because I'm going to need to heal. So anyone that you schedule needs to be after that, schedule a coverage person for that week if the person can't wait. And the the team member who was responsible for scheduling scheduled for the very first business day which was about 48 hours after this person had a medical procedure so my answer was well what did you say in response to your team member blatantly disregarding your rather clear, clear instruction about the fact that you were not going to be available that day and her response was well i knew that we needed to make sales so i just i just let it go and several problems arise from that, right? You know, it's not just the, um, you know, the, the staff person was being um, willfully contumacious. <laughs> it wasn't that the person was saying, screw you, boss, I'm going to do this anyway. It really was that the person was in her habit, right? She's in the habit of booking people first available time that the calendar says the lawyer is available. And so she was in her habit and she is not in your rule. Your rule says I'm not available. Now, there could have been a calendaring issue. There could have been that the lawyer did not commit to her rule. So the lawyer could have made her schedule more seemingly available than it actually is. But let's just say that the calendar was blocked out and the team member did this anyway. In that instance, the team member disregarded the instruction, but probably thought our highest priority for me to be successful, me the team member, for me to be successful, I have to get people booked as soon as they come in. That has always been the edict. So it would seem to be a conflict for me that boss is saying, don't schedule on Monday. And my mind is saying, and I've been previously told, schedule no matter what at all costs, your success is scheduling as many people as possible. So now I perceive a conflict as the staff, me the staff member. And rather than have a conversation, I'm just gonna go with what my instinct tells me is right, and I'm gonna schedule. And instead of the business owner saying, um, wait a minute now, we previously had a conversation, I told you what this new rule is, she let it go because she also defected or defaulted, I should say, she defected from her rule, but she defaulted to the previous rule rather than the, the new rule. And that's a very common thing to do, right? Whenever we are pushing ourselves in a new direction, if we don't yet have a level of comfort with our new rule and we don't yet have faith that the new rule is a better rule than the old rule, we will instinctually slide back because we all are creatures of habit. And so the habit is always gonna predominate over the new process that we are putting in place. So it's very important that when you communicate to your team that you put teeth to your communication. Now that does not mean that you get up and bite your team members. <laughs> I know some people that might be inclined to do that. Um, this, this, this teeth that I'm talking about, having teeth in your rule, is about being firm. And it's about impressing upon the team member, especially if it's a habit that you are really sold on and excited about, but not one that you are necessarily going to easily implement. You really want to make sure that you tell your team members and tell them in a way that is going to impress upon them how serious and how significant this is for you. In other words, don't just shoot out an email and say, hey, I'm unavailable between time A and time B, right? Don't make it like an afterthought. Stop what you're doing. Call the people that need to know into your office. 
if you have assembled your office the way that I tend to coach lawyers to do, there is a point person for every position that will then communicate with the level of tenacity necessary to all of the people that are in that division. So your paralegal is going to communicate to all of your other paralegals. Your office administrator is going to communicate to all of the support staff. Your managing attorney is going to communicate to all of the other attorneys etc. You know, you don't have to stop the office and have a staff meeting about your schedule. But depending on how serious you need this schedule to be adhered to, you might choose to do that, right? This is not a right way versus wrong way conversation. This is really about what tends to be most effective, okay? So you have to find what's most effective based on how you have structured your law firm. But it's most important that you communicate it in a way that says, this is something new. This is something you're not familiar with. This is something that I'm not familiar with, but this is something that we are now going to install in the law firm in order that I am more productive so that I can be more successful at my role so that you all will be more successful in your roles so that the firm will prosper. And you have to have a level of intentionality around the communication. Don't make it into a threatening, ne negative, nasty communication, but it has to be firm, clear, concise, and people have to know this is not optional for you. So if you start to deviate from the new process, someone has to be empowered to call you on your stuff, to stop you and say, hey, wait, 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 didn't you tell me just yesterday you wanted me to do it the new way? And when you say, oh yeah, but you know, this is just five minutes, they need to feel comfortable to say, okay, boss, this is not what we talked about, remember you said the importance of this rule is blah, blah, blah. And if you don't have people on your team that have that level of comfort having that communication with you, you either have not set the right communication tone with your team or you don't have the right team, okay? Uh, but your team needs to be able to hold you accountable so that you can be the leader that you need to be just as you are holding them accountable to the things that they need to do in order that their roles are executed well. Now, you're not just going to communicate your new rule to your team. You're also going to communicate it to your clients. But with clients, it tends to be a little bit easier because frankly, whether you have one client or you have 50 clients, I always advise that the new rule for how to reach you and when they can expect to reach you should be communicated in writing and it should be communicated with instruction. So that means you're not just going to tell clients, hey, I'm going to be unavailable from time A to time B, or hey, instead of calling the office, I want you to uh, use my scheduler, or hey, instead of calling the office or using my scheduler, I want you to send an email every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Whatever your process is, it is, right? But you have to communicate it to your clients and then tell them this is when you're going to use the process and here are the exceptions to the rule. And I say exceptions to the rule because there will invariably be the person who calls in with the question, hey, I got the letter that says I'm supposed to schedule myself for an appointment, but what if I have an issue that comes up that can't wait until the next scheduled appointment? Or what if I have a quote unquote emergency? Now, of course, this is really where you have to be very systematized. And we're going to talk about systematizing when we get to the S in focus. But clients need to know what you define as an emergency because everybody has a different level of comfort with things that are uncomfortable. So clients are typically being represented by a lawyer when they are in some form of distress. That means they're often going to be emotionally triggered, they're going to be frustrated, they're going to be walking on eggshells, they're going to be uneased. And so they are much more likely to over include in the emergency category than you would. And since they are not lawyers, you cannot fault them for being emotionally distressed. Let them have whatever emotional feelings that they have and let them process them, but that does not mean you have to accede to their emotions. If you have given them clarity, you can hold them accountable to what you have clearly communicated. So tell them, here's how to reach me generally. And in the event of the following emergencies and only the following emergencies, you may use this alternate means. But let them know, and that then helps everybody to get on the same page. And that, that also includes that your clients have to be held accountable when they deviate because 
they're also not living in your head based on your rules. They are living their own lives. They've got their own stuff. <laughs> so you want to make it easy for them. And if they happen to deviate by calling in a way that they're not supposed to or emailing in a way they're not supposed to or whatever it is, don't go getting all pissed off. Don't go blaming your client and saying, look, this person is just blatantly violating my rule because they're being difficult. Let the person know Okay, so I don't know if you remember this, but we've established a new protocol. This helps me to provide better service overall to all of my clients. So I'm insisting upon this new protocol. But listen, mistakes happen, I get it. We're going to now go back to the protocol that I communicated to you in writing and insist upon that and insist upon it for their benefit. Because remember, people do things for their reasons, not your reasons. So if you say, hey, my life is easier when you follow my rules, nobody gives a shit, <laughs> okay? You have to make it clear to them that you're doing this for them as well, that when we have this new procedure, I am more productive, I am more efficient, I get more things done, I do things in a better way overall for my clients, and that includes you. All right, so again, we are now on the you in focus, okay? We've covered... First, what to do, which is deciding on the goal. We've covered organizing, that's macro level and micro level. We've covered communicating, i.e. communicate to everyone who's gonna interact with your schedule, how your schedule is to run. And now we are talking about you, which is use your discretion. All right, so this is basically a, is a corollary to communicating. Essentially, you have the control as the business owner, and I don't want you to ever forget that. Okay, so if you have decided that you have a way that your calendar is going to run, that you have goals that you're going to hit, that you're going to have quarterly check-ins on your goal, and you're going to be pacing to a goal at the end of the year, you absolutely need to know that you can use discretion to deviate if something requires it. Okay, deviation doesn't mean screw the rule. <laughs> okay, deviation is a slight stepping off the path of your rule and then stepping right back on the path of your rule. Now, there are times where you need to continue to refine your process. This is not what I'm talking about, okay? Refining the process is really in the organization process. So remember I said earlier, don't just go get somebody else's block calendaring schedule and then copy and paste it for yourself. You really have to think about who you are, when your energy is at the height or the low, where you like to spend your time, how you like to spend your time. You know, I remember when I was actively handling in excess of 50 clients, there were some people that I just could not handle talking to at the beginning of the day. Like they, they triggered me, they tired me out. I would be in a bad mood if I, had, if I had to deal with them first thing in the morning. I had to kind of work my way up to them. And there were other people that I loved talking to so much that I would wait until the, the end of the day when I was typically the most tired because they would energize me. And I loved helping them so much that no matter what time of the day I was talking to them, at six in the, in the evening, at four in the morning, on a weekend, didn't really matter. I was going to give them my all because I, I love the person that much, right? So you have to think about who you are and how you function when you are creating your rules. But sometimes you might not know, right? You might not know if you aren't really attuned to it when you are at your energetic best. And you might not know when you have the most productive communications with your team members. So you might want to try and test and do different things. So this is not what using your discretion is, okay? I'm not talking about getting into a habit of changing the rules to fit whatever comes in that day. You have to hold firm to the rules that you created. And that means when you get an email that you are eager to deal with, you have to suppress the urge to deal with it. And if for you, suppressing that urge is something that is going to take a lot of energy, then you probably want to restructure the way that your office is set up so you don't even see the email, right? There, there are some clients that I have that filter their email in such a way that they don't even see the new emails. They go right into the client inbox. They have a, a client management system where the client's names are set up on the folders. And as soon as the email comes in, it goes right into the client's assigned folder so that they wait until the end of the day. There's nothing in their inbox to distract them. They wait until the end of the day to deal with those emails. And they tell clients, 
if your email deals with X, Y, or Z, call the office. That will always be a more important way or a better way to get a hold of us when your situation warrants it. All right, so we know that we're rarely going to deviate. Deviations are short-term you know, steps off the path. If there's a longer term step off the path or a reconsideration of the path because of change of circumstances, you know, we know that a lot of people were changing their path because of COVID this year. Uh, we are in the year of 2020, what I call the longest year of all of our lives, <laughs> right? We're, we, we've, we've all kind of had to pivot and shift to deal with um, kind of the tectonic plates shifting beneath us because of COVID. That's also not what use your discretion is. This really only, only applies to um, something aberrational, something that's only going to happen once, something that uh, required an immediate response or an emergency in your own personal life that could have caused you to deviate from your schedule. And this is really about getting control over yourself to maintain your schedule, okay? Now, the final letter in focus, we've covered what happens first, we've covered organizing, communicating, and using discretion. The fifth and final component of the focus system is systematizing. Now, systematizing, I'm sure you guys have heard me talk about before, because I talk about systematizing for everything. I'm a big proponent of creating ease around everything, and the only thing that was able to get me to a point where I only needed five to ten hours a week to run my multi-million dollar law firm was getting to the point where everything was systematized. Systems for how we communicate, when we communicate, when we meet, how we manage money, how we market, how we sell, all of the activity in this law firm runs on a system. And if something comes up that we have not dealt with before, whoever is responsible for it knows in our systems culture that they are to create a system for it and have that system ultimately approved. We will beta test it, run it, see if it works. If it works, that becomes the law of the land. And that becomes the way, not a way, the way we will do everything in the firm relating to that activity. But you have to get there in order to give yourself the freedom to create in the areas where it's needed. So I will use COVID as the perfect example. Just very recently, someone posted in an online Facebook group about um, successes of COVID. And I think a lot of people have been reticent to share that they are doing well in 2020 because a lot of people are not doing well. So if you are one of the people who are not doing well, know that I am sharing this particular example, not because I want you to feel bad about your circumstances. You are in the majority. The majority of people have not done well in 2020 relative to prior years. But there are people that have done well, and it's not because they are superior people. So please hear me say that. Please know that this is not a characterological trait that some people do well and some people don't when there are economic um, recessions or negative circumstances that happen. But the people that have been able to weather this storm were not necessarily the people who had the most savings or the people who are the most conservative about how they live, their, you know, live in their business. It's been the people that had a system in place so that their time was not immediately eviscerated because they couldn't get to everything, right? So the people that just kind of come in and work through the day based on whatever the day brings, right? Oh, today I've got a motion on the calendar. I've got a client afternoon, a client coming in in the afternoon. I've got some emails to draft. That happens, and then the next day may be different. The next day may be great. I've got some documents to review. I've got a negotiation to take place uh, midday at settlement conference, and then I have um, some team meetings to happen in the afternoon, right? You have two very different days from day one to day two, and that's fine as long as you are relatively stationary in the, in the business that you have. You have a $300,000 business. You have had a $300,000 business for the last four years. You intend to have a $300,000 business next year, and everything's moving right on along. The problem happens when shit happens, like happened this year, and now all of a sudden you are homeschooling your children while you are also having to move your office from being physically in an office building to being a remote structure. And you are having to completely revamp the way that you communicate with your team because they're not down the hall anymore. 
<laughs> they're in their homes and you're in your home. And you're having to adjust to changing financial structures because let's say a third of your clients are suddenly unemployed. And how you were able to respond was not about your character, it was about your approach to business. And so for those of us who have an approach of, okay, I figure it out when it happens and I deal with things as they come, rather than people who live in the future, right? Where we are going inherently implicates where we are right now. Because if I know I wanna grow by 50% this year, I can't possibly do that without either running 50% faster than I did last year, which for most lawyers is impossible, or creating plans that inherently have me tracking, if I need to get to 50% by the end of the year, I need to grow by 12.5% quarter one, 12.5% by quarter two, 12.5% in quarter three, and that aggregates to 37.5%. And then by the end of the quarter, the fourth quarter, I'll do that last 12.5% and I'm at my 50% margin goal right? It's, it's about intentionality. And so one of the things that I was able to do in this law firm was instead of my law firm taking five to 10 hours of my week, it surged up when COVID hit to maybe 15 hours of the week, because I was concerned about making sure that my team was okay, emotionally, making sure that they had the resources that they needed. And we were already a relatively paperless, relatively cloud-based, relatively uh, laptop based law firm. So that didn't require a whole lot, but there were some IT tech uh, issues that came up that all of a sudden we now needed to get our tech support on the line. And they required longer because everybody needed more tech support, right? And a lot of people that they service needed more tech support than we did because of the way we were already set up. So a lot of the process of Picking, our, picking up our law firm and moving us all to our respective homes became a lot easier because we had a system for everything that we do. So instead of thinking, oh my God, okay, well, we have to now change everything and we're gonna have to move people around and we're gonna have to deal with shifting issues with our money. Every person that was dealing with something in the business, whether it was dealing with money or dealing with marketing or dealing with sales or dealing with people or dealing with clients, every person could consult our system. So if our system was that this is the way that we communicate with our clients, the frequency with which we communicate, the process that we use to relay information, sometimes we communicate by email, sometimes by phone, sometimes in person, those things needed to shift because we needed to give more client care in order to ensure that the clients were okay and to start looking at whether or not they would be impacted in their employment because of COVID. And so if they were impacted, we needed to not only think about present impacts, but future impacts and plan for how we were going to make sure that we brought in enough clients so that we would ultimately be able to weather the storm while we were in this state of quarantine, while jobs were affected, while the economy was struggling, et cetera. Right. So all of those shifting tectonic plates, we could handle with a level of ease and a level of consistency that a lot of other firms couldn't, not because we're superior, but because we are systematized. Because it's a lot easier to consult a system and say, where do I need to tweak this system? Or can the system work in the new reality of our working remotely? If it can't, we need to write a new system real quick, right? Let's stop what we're doing, write a new system. And that system may or may not work because we haven't used it before, but we're gonna try it, we're gonna test it, we're gonna tweak it, we're gonna improve it. And that happens at a much faster pace in a law firm that has a systems culture than in a law firm that says, we fly by the seat of our pants, or for even those of you that have a manual, like there are a lot of people that love saying, oh, we have an employee manual. If your manual is about the dress code, that shit's not going to help you when it's time to figure out how do we get more clients, <laughs> right? If we haven't systematized our marketing, if we haven't systematized how we're selling, if we don't learn the skill of selling and we think about 
we as lawyers are professionals and we are thus in the business of consulting. So I give out legal advice in the consultation. And if the person would like to hire me, I give them that option and I give them an agreement and say, here, go think about it. If that's what you're doing, you are not selling. And so if you were not selling and you're in a business and a business is facing an economic decline, what do you do? You hope for the best and you probably get a little desperate when you're consulting with somebody and say, God, I hope that they want to work with me. I hope that I have impressed upon them that I'm the one to give it to them. And sometimes that works, but not because you were desperate and praying, <laughs> but because at that point, the client had made a decision based on what they were hearing in their head, right? Based on who they were, based on what they wanted. You were tangential to the process. You were not directing and guiding and leading the process. But I say all of that because I am a big proponent of systems. I love systems because they create freedom. And a time that could have been a cataclysmic, psychological, pardon my French, clusterfra <laughs> in, in our business wasn't because we had systems in place to be able to rely upon. And so when you, when you hire the right people and you give them a system and you teach them how to create systems and to think in terms of systems, it becomes a lot easier for the system to sustain you in times of great stress, in times where everything is changing, you have something to anchor yourself to that can then be revamped as necessary or that can just be, if it's already a system that's working remarkably well, you can put the pedal to the metal on that system and ride it off into the sunset as you are going through whatever you're going through. And that's true, not just for economic circumstances like COVID or health circumstances like COVID, however you wanna look at it, it's both, um, but also for what happens when um, a key member in your family dies and you need to take extended time away? Or what happens when a key member on your team uh, is critically injured and has to stop working? Or what happens when um, your largest client decides that they are going to either go with another law firm or they are simply revamping the way that they consume legal services and won't need you for 25% of the work that they previously fed you? Right? When those types of major events happen, systems give you a level of continuity and a level of ease to be able to solve problems that you don't have when you are flying by the seat of your pants. And most lawyers instinctually know that, which is the reason why most law firm owners don't want to grow. They desire to grow, right? They, and in their heart of hearts, they say, I want more. I know that I can help more people. I know that I can make a bigger impact. I know that I can make more money. I know that I can have a, a better existence. I can work nine to five Monday through Friday if I structure my business to be that, but it can't be that if I want it to be that. It could be nine to five Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I take Tuesday and Thursday off with my young kids or to just give myself thought work time or to be with my family or to be creative working in another business. But I can't do that. I can't have that. I have all of the story wrapped in the I can't, I won't, it won't work for me because we are reactionary in business rather than creatively structured in business. And for those of you that are not structured people and your mind resists that, I wanna give you an invitation to think about this not as a way of controlling yourself, but a way of freeing yourself. Focus frees us. Focus gives us the ability to be productive and to plan our productivity and not be reactionary where we are simply being busy and getting a lot of things done that don't matter in the grand scheme of things. All right, everyone, we have covered focus. For those of you that have not already seen the video, there is an, a, an abbreviated version of this discussion that was um, recorded earlier this year. Uh, it's, it's, ho it's housed on uh, our, our YouTube channel. Again, youtube.com forward slash law firm mentor. And for those of you that want to hear more of this type of content, not just here on the podcast, we, you know, we do record the podcast every week. So you always have the opportunity to get what you need here as a resource to help you become the business owner 
who can own the law firm of your dreams. But we also uh, provide a lot of content on these topics about the business of law in the Law Firm Mentor Movement closed Facebook group. So I invite you to join that group as well. And for this week, I'm Allison Williams, your Law Firm Mentor, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Crushing Chaos with Law Firm Mentor podcast. To learn more about today's guest and take advantage of the resources mentioned, check out our show notes. And if you own a solo or small law firm and are looking for guidance, advice, or simply support on your journey to create a law firm that runs without you, join us in the Law Firm Mentor Movement free Facebook group. There, you can access our free trainings on improving collections in law firms, meeting billable hours, and join the movement of thousands of law firm owners across the country who want to crush chaos in their law firms and make more money. I'm Allison Williams, your law firm mentor. Have a great day.